<clears throat> okay, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me today. And I'd also like to thank Karen Kuntz for uh, coming up from Airdrie this morning to join me uh, for this announcement. And I believe also to stay for the tabling of Bill 61, the Vital Statistics Amendment Act of 2021 in the legislature this afternoon. <laughs> One year ago, I learned about a loophole in Alberta's legislation that permitted convicted sex offenders from being able to con complete a legal change of name. My counterparts in Saskatchewan had begun to close a similar loophole in their legislation, and this made me question whether the same problem existed here in Alberta. And I was shocked to learn that it did. Albertans, including those actively involved in working with survivors and advocating for them, also had no idea that there was no such prohibition on these offenders changing their names. As I said at the time, such a loophole is completely unacceptable, and so in June, I stood here with the Premier to announce that we were taking action. We knew at the time that we might need to extend those prohibitions, but it was important for us at that time that we take that first step. The importance of acting quickly was reinforced when I heard that within a week of speaking with the CEO of Edmonton Zebra Center, she had a file cross her desk that involved exactly that type of situation where a convicted sex offender had reoffended after having changed their name. Today I'm standing before you to say that Alberta's government is taking an important next step to protect Alberta families and to keep our communities safe. Today I will be tabling amendments to ensure that those designated as dangerous offenders and long-term offenders will be required to live with the names they were convicted under for the rest of their lives. Furthermore, high-risk offenders will not be able to legally change their names as long as they are deemed to be a high risk. This is the right thing to do, and as Minister of Service Alberta, it is another step that I can take to protect Alberta families. This is a case where doing nothing is not an option. To accept the status quo is to embrace an unacceptable public safety risk for Albertans. This is a real problem, and just months ago, an Edmonton dangerous offender sought to have a court ban publication of his desire to change his name. The thoughts that, that someone as, with such a violent criminal history, such as the monster, Leo Teske, the thought that he could change his name and then blend into and hide in our communities and hide from his past is completely abhorrent. And so we cannot wait any longer to bring these changes forward. This is all about the safety of Alberta families and Alberta communities. This is about giving some sense of peace of mind for survivors and the families of victims. It is important for me to highlight that these changes that I am proposing are targeted toward a very small subset of the most violent criminals. Receiving the designation of dangerous offender or long-term offender means that the Crown has very strong concerns about a convicted criminal's crimes and their possibility of rehabilitation. To be labeled a dangerous offender means that the offender has been convicted of or pled guilty to serious personal injury offenses and have demonstrated a repeated pattern of behavior that is unlikely to change and constitutes a threat to the life, safety, or physical or mental well-being of others. The Crown must be able to prove that the offender is likely to commit serious harm or injury in the future. I mentioned earlier that high-risk offenders would be unable to legally change their names as long as they were deemed to be a high risk. This is an important distinction. The Crown must prove the need to designate someone a dangerous or long-term offender. But law enforcement determines who should be designated high risk. This decision is made before a serious violent offender is released from prison while still being considered to be a significant safety risk. With all of these designations, there is a significant safety risk to the public, to Alberta families, and to our communities. And this is why I'm proposing these changes. Unfortunately, as with convicted sex offenders, violent offenders can and do cross provincial and territorial borders. The changes I am taking, uh, that I'm talking about here today will help to ensure the safety and protection of Canadian families and communities. But these protections stop at Alberta's border. 
That is why I am once again issuing a call to action to my counterparts all across the country. And I am inviting them to join us in implementing these important and strong protections. Today, each of my counterparts across the country and each justice minister will receive a letter from me outlining the changes that we are making and, that, and also encouraging them to join us in implementing these strong protections. Legislation around legal name changes is developed at the provincial level, and we need all Canadian provinces and territories to take similar action. Every Canadian should be assured of their safety. The primary goal of government is to protect its citizens, and amending this legislation will do just that. It is the right thing to do, and I'm proud to take this action today. Because Albertans should not need to wonder or worry about the ability of a violent, dangerous offender to legally change their name and to move in next door or down the street without community members being aware of their violent past. Let me assure you, that's not going to happen under my watch. And with that, I'd like to invite Karen Kuntz to say a few words. Karen is the Executive Director of the Airdrie and District Victims Assistance Society, and I'm very pleased to be joined by her here today. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, and thank you for allowing me this opportunity to be here today and to speak to this very important topic. For the last 23 years, I've, invo I've been involved with victim services in a number of roles, and currently I am the Executive Director for Airdrie Victim Services. I feel so passionate about supporting victims and their rights. When you look at the Victims of Crime Act principles and the Victim Bill of Rights, we know victims and survivors have the right to protection and the right to information. It is imperative that they have the information in accordance with the law. The policies and procedures about the status of the investigation, the scheduling progress, and the final outcomes of the proceedings, and the status of the offender in the correctional system. Each day we work with victims. We work with them from the time of the incident. We support them with information. We help them to navigate the process in the criminal justice system. Their need for information throughout this process does not end once the offender has been sentenced. When we look at the victim's rights, it clearly states that victims have the right to information during the justice process, as well as the status of the offender while in the correctional system and notification of release. Bill 61 will take that one step further. This will give the victim the assurance their offender status does not change once they are released. And not only do I believe the victim has the right to safety, but the community as a whole should be allowed to be and feel safe. I am a mother and a grandmother, and I want to know who my neighbor is. Further to the work that I do with victims, I know firsthand what it's like to be a victim. I am a survivor of aggravated sexual assault. Years ago, I was violently raped. That night, I was fighting for my life. Finally, at one point, I realized I couldn't fight anymore, and I truly believed I was going to die. When it was over, he introduced himself to me. He asked me my name and told me if I would go to the police, he would come back to kill me. He got three years in jail, and I got the life sentence. I have spent that lifetime looking over my shoulder, always wondering if he would come back, always wondering if he would hurt me again. This became a way of life for me, afraid not only for myself, but for my daughters, afraid he would be waiting for them after school and would hurt them. When my husband was away, I would plan a sleepover in the living room for us, and I would have a quick escape plan. I knew this guy knew who I was. How much more fearful would I, have had, would I have been had I not known who he was or who I was watching for? There were times in my life I wished I had changed my name and had been given the safety of hiding in that. Having said that, this is no longer about me. This is about victims and survivors now. It's about their assurance, it's about their protection, and it's about their information. It's about their rights, and it's about empowering them. Victims and survivors have no choice but to live with the consequences of what another person chose to do to them. They need to manage what's in front of them, and they need to do the work to survive. 
So therefore, I believe those who make the conscious choice to intentionally hurt another human being, someone who drastically changed the course of that person's life, they, the offender, should never be allowed to hide. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, for those powerful words and for sharing your story. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you. Uh, Minister and Ms. Kuntz, both are willing to take your questions this morning. So what we'll do is we'll do one question and one follow-up. Operator, can you put through the first caller, please? First is Ashley Joanna with Post Media Edmonton. Go ahead, Ashley. Hi, good morning. This is a question for the Minister. Um, w when it comes to dangerous offender and long-term offender status, um, those offenders I know is the hearing in court, have a defense lawyer, um, that kind of thing. Can you tell me a little bit more about the high-risk offender status? Does someone have a chance to defend themselves against getting that status? And what work is involved in having that status removed? What I can tell you is that the differences between those two categories you've described uh, is an important one to be mindful of. And that's why we've made it clear that dangerous offenders and long-term offenders once they are designated as such, they will never be permitted to have a legal change of name in Alberta. Whereas high-risk offenders, that prohibition will only uh, last for however long they are deemed to be a high-risk offender. Uh, in terms of the specific legal nuances, uh, I would encourage you to follow up with uh, the Department of Justice. Do you have a follow-up, Ashley? Um, I do. Um can you tell me whether you received any feedback from the other jurisdictions that you sent those letters to back in, I believe it was June or July, with regards to calling for other jurisdictions to institute similar bans? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I have had some, some very positive feedback from, from some of my colleagues in other jurisdictions, uh, and I have been working closely with them to ensure that they can benefit from what we learned as we brought our legislation forward, uh, hopefully to pave the way to make it easier for them to implement similar strong protections. As I said earlier, that all Canadians will benefit from a standardized approach across the country to ensure that none of these types of offenders can cross our borders to a jurisdiction that does not have similar protections and change their name. So um, you know, I'm committed to doing everything I can to make Alberta safer and to protect Alberta families. And, uh, but I want all Albertans to know that uh, should I be successful in passing this legislation in the coming weeks, my job doesn't stop there. My job continues to uh, raise awareness and advocate among my colleagues all across the country and to do everything in my power to equip them to be successful in implementing the same protections in their province or territory. Operator, can you put through the next caller, please? Next is Janet French with CBC. Go ahead, Janet. Hi there. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, for the minister, I, I'm just looking for some clarity. In your letter, you say that the government of Alberta is the first to make changes to the vital, st vital statistics legislation, but Saskatchewan has already done it for sexual offenders. So are you asking Saskatchewan to expand their definition? I'm a little bit confused about what you what you want from them. Sure. Thank you, Janet. Uh, happy to clarify. So Saskatchewan uh, was ahead of us in implementing uh, changes to their legislation to prohibit convicted sex offenders from being able to change their names. And I think I may have referenced that a bit in my opening remarks that, that it, was, it was ultimately as a result of that uh, work they started that I started to ask the question of, well, do we have the same problem here? And I was shocked to learn that we did. And that's why we moved so quickly last year to expand uh, or, or to, to, to implement those protections by amending the Vital Statistics Act as it related to convicted sex offenders and legal changes of name. Now that we're talking about dangerous offenders, long-term offenders, and high-risk offenders, we are the first to move in this direction. And I'm urging all of my counterparts all across the country, including Saskatchewan, to, uh, to join us in this important effort. And uh, I'm looking forward to having conversations with, with my colleagues um, in those jurisdictions to, to make the case and to also uh, equip them with what we've learned and the work that we've done so that they don't have to reinvent the wheel 
and that we can all uh, move forward as quickly as possible to make uh, all communities across Canada just a little bit safer. And did you have a follow-up, Janet? I do. I'm looking for some sort of statistics, and I don't know whether this is a Karen question or a minister question. Um, I'm curious, uh, basically, how frequently is this happening that that um, violent offenders are trying to change their identity? And also, do we know how many dangerous offenders, long-term offenders there are right now in Alberta? I realize high risk is a non-off designation. So, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, happy to take a first crack, and then, Karen, if you have anything you'd like to add, please feel free. Um, for, for, for me, the, the key is even one instance of a convicted sex offender or a dangerous offender or a long-term offender or a high-risk offender changing their names and hiding from their past and hiding in our communities, even one instance of that is unacceptable. The, the survivors of such violence who've had to endure such trauma, and you know Karen's story was such a powerful story, um, the folks who've had to endure that have, as Karen said, uh, have, have been given a life sentence and will have to live with such trauma for the rest of their lives. Under my watch, I'm unwilling to allow even one of these violent criminals to be able to uh, uh, change their names, hide from their past, get a fresh start, because I know that they, that, that they pose a, a significant public safety risk. My focus is to protect Alberta families and Alberta communities. And one of the steps that we need to take to make sure that that happens is to ensure that these, these I can't think of no better word than monster, that these monsters have to live with their names for the rest of their lives. In terms of specific statistics, we could follow up with you afterwards. Um, and Karen, if there's anything you want to add, please feel free. Yeah, when it comes to uh, the statistics, I'm not 100% sure myself either I could follow up with that, but I do agree with the minister. I think just one person um, is more than enough. And I know just the idea of a victim or survivor knowing that that's a possibility only adds to that intensity of the trauma and, um, you know, um, is a barrier also in healing. Thank you, Karen. And Janet, I'll follow up with you um, offline. Operator, can you put through the next caller, please? Next is Catherine Grakowski with Alberta Today. Go ahead, Catherine. Yeah, thanks for taking my question. I guess I have a question for Karen. Um, the person who attacked you, would were they designated a dangerous offender or long-term offender or high-risk offender? Did they receive any of these designations at any point? No, no. This this was so many years ago that this happened, and he had um, a sentence of three years. I'm not even sure myself um, whether he served the full term of that or not, but I don't believe that he was uh, deemed a high-risk offender. Okay. Did you have and a follow-up? Uh, yeah, a question for the, the minister. Um, so this ban applies for life, even even if the designation gets removed, um, how, how often is it that these, these type of designations get overturned? So for starters, just to clarify, the, the lifetime ban is on the dangerous offenders and the long-term offenders. Uh, the high-risk offenders, are uh, the ban persists for as long as they are classified as a high-risk offender. In terms of the frequency with which uh, dangerous offenders and, and um, long-term offenders are overturned, I, I don't have the, the specific uh, numbers handy, but I'm sure my staff can follow up with you offline to, to clarify. But uh, my understanding is it is quite infrequent, um, as it you know it takes a lot to be qual to be um, classified by these uh, these extreme designations, um, and. Uh, you know, these are reserved for the most violent, the most vile criminals in society, uh, and the ones who have the least probability of rehabilitation. And so that is that is why I believe it is uh, completely appropriate for us to implement these changes to the, the legislation to ensure that these individuals will never be able to change their names and hide from their past. Operator, can you put through the next caller, please? The final question on the line is Audrey Nouveau with Radio Canada. Go ahead, Audrey. 
Hi, my question is for uh, the minister. I want to know if Alberta is at first at least the only province to make that legislative change and an offender changes their name successfully in another province, is there anything Alberta can do to kind of block that or counter it in the meantime until presumably all the provinces and territories will make a similar change? Yeah, thank you. That's a good question. And, and I think your question ultimately highlights why it is so important that we work, uh, once we get this, the, this legislation completed in Alberta, that we work hard to, uh, to persuade uh, our colleagues across the country to, to follow our lead. Because ultimately the only way we can guarantee that this doesn't happen, uh, where, where, where an offender uh, leaves Alberta and goes to a different jurisdiction to change their name and then comes back, the only way we can prevent that from happening with 100% certainty is to ensure that every jurisdiction in Canada follows our lead and implements these important strong protections. So as I said in, in my earlier remarks uh, and in some, an answer to an earlier question, should I be successful at passing this legislation in the coming weeks? My, the, my job is not done. My job will continue so long as I need to work with my colleagues across the country to persuade them to join us in implementing these strong protections. Did you have a follow-up, Audrey? Yes, I, I know you answered that a little earlier, but I, I missed uh, what you said. Which provinces have already given you uh, an answer back saying they are interested in following Alberta's lead? So uh, when it comes to the dangerous offender uh, and long-term offender and high-risk offender uh, changes, uh, as we are just tabling that today, my letters and, and communications will go out today to my colleagues. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to beginning that important discussion uh, in the days and weeks ahead. When it comes to uh, the legislation we passed last year on uh, preventing convicted sex offenders from uh, completing a legal change of name. We've had a number of discussions with some of my colleagues across the province. Uh, I know that there's some significant interest in Ontario, uh, as well as a few other jurisdictions. Um, of course, uh, there's a process to passing legislation, and so I don't want to speak on behalf of other governments, but I can tell you there's a lot of interest, and uh, as I said before, um, my work isn't done until I have done everything in my power to, to equip my colleagues with everything they would need to join us in implementing these important and strong protections for the benefit of all Canadians to keep our communities and families safe. All right, thank you everyone. That concludes our event for today. Have a great day.